us begin this conversation first taking our quote from George Bernard Shaw, who is an Irish playwright, critic, and political activist, once said, Patriotism is fundamentally a conviction that a particular country is the best in the world because you were born in it. Absolutely. My next quote is from Franklin um, D. Roosevelt, who was an American statesman and politician, served as the 32nd president of the United States from 1933 until his death in 1945. He once said, Human kindness has never weakened the stamina or softened the fiber of a free people. A nation does not have to be cruel to be tough. I agree. All right, we'll take our next one from Chris Jami, who is an author. He once said that the greater ignorance towards the country is not ignoring what its politicians have to say. It is ignoring what the inmates in its prisons have to say. I'm sure you're talking about the ordinary people. All right, we move to Amit Kalantri, who is also an author, once said, society will question your reputation, but it will believe your defamation without question. Oops. I'll take my last one from Marcus Aurelius, who is a Roman emperor from 161 to 180 and a stoic philosopher, once said, all that happens is, a, is as habitual and familiar as roses in spring and fruit in the summer, true to of disease, death, defamation, and conspiracy, and all that delights or gives pain to fools. Whoops. Let's see how this goes relate to what we'll be discussing today. Very warm greetings and welcome to The Conversation, reaching you from Kaftan's television studio here in the nation's capital, Abuja. I am Annabel Oji. Today we'll turn our attention to, um, so, in fact, we have so many things to discuss about. State of the nation, mood of the nation, leadership process, leadership recruitment, bank capitalization, down to um, governance, politics, election matters, and then defamation matters. All of that plus more we're going to be discussing today on The Conversation. Now my guest is Comrade DG Adeoju, who is a civil rights activist, and he's also a legal practitioner. He's been saying stuff plenty plenty stuff and we're going to bring all that and talk about it today on the conversation ladies and gentlemen go grab your seats get your cup of water all your freshly made juice and let us have this conversation with dg adeoju welcome to the conversation and i will be your host <music> Welcome back. If you just joined us, this is the conversation reaching you from Kaftan's television today here in the nation's capital, Abuja. Now we'll go straight to our conversation for today. My guest is a legal practitioner and he is an activist. DG Adeonjo is my guest on the show today. Great to have you on the show today, sir. Thank you for having me on the show. Great, great. All right, now let's, so many things to talk about, but then let's start with, um, let's start from the election. Um, in few days or weeks, we would be um, celebrating or commemorating, whatever the case may be, um, 25 years of democracy, and then this government would um, be celebrating their one year in office. And then I hear some people say that after one year, it looks like we are just almost like we're not, we're not there yet. So what are your thoughts with regards to um, how the elections, uh, where, where, how we started and then where we are now, even as we're looking forward to one year after? Yeah, sincerely speaking, I think we, we are faring very badly as a nation and there's practically nothing to celebrate. I hope the president will take a cue from his cancellation of his birthday celebration to also not cancel all celebrations whatsoever. Uh, as regards to May 29th, uh, Democracy Day, because there's practically nothing to celebrate. Ours now is a nation where we have never had inflation this high before. We have never had unemployment this high before. We've never had hunger so high before that even religious leaders are now joining hunger protests, are uh, complaining about the hunger in the line, land. Traditional rulers, same thing. Everybody is suffering. Uh, the Tinubu government has united everybody whether you supported uh, his government or you did not. Everybody is crying in unity due to the hardship in the country. Electricity tariffs have gone up, fuel prices have gone up, the uh, price of dollar has gone up, everything has gone up. Even the price of Indian with the children are crying. So there's practically no one has been spared. And the government is tone deaf because if the government is not tone deaf, 
Inflation is at almost at 31 percent, and you are still raising electricity tariff. You know, you are raising raising custom tariff. So the, 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 the government wants the roof to come down on the citizenry because there's nothing else to explain uh, the tone deafness of the government as regards to the economic plights of the country. And the policies of the government do not inspire confidence. There's practically no anti-corruption going on in the country. So why will anybody bring their money here? You know, they, they think by raising interest rates. When you raise interest rates, but inflation rates are to the roof. So who will come and invest here? Nobody. Mm. I hear you say that um, the government is tone deaf, but there's some other persons who will not agree in that um, regard. They will tell you that at least this government looks like the one that hears when the, when people are backlashing and then they, they they just retreat and then go back to think about it again. But then it looks like you have a different opinion in that regard. A government where all religious leaders, traditional leaders in the country have called on the government to do something about hunger in the land. The vice president, Kashim Shetima, said the people that are behind the hunger are those who lost election in the last... Uh, are, those, are politicians who lost election. Is that a government that listens to people? This is a government where the Senate president said that the hunger protest is fake, that there's no hunger in the country. This is a government... Look at the level of economic decadence in the government. Look at the way a public is sharing money in the National Assembly. The government is apparently tone deaf. You know, the government is not responding to the inflation situation in the country. The greatest challenge we have today as a nation is the inflation challenge in the country. And they keep increasing custom tariff. This is, we do not produce anything here. Even toothpick is imported into this country. Toothpaste is imported into the country. Toothbrush is imported into the country. And you are raising, the, you are raising tariffs. So the government is not listening. They are not listening to the cries of the people. You buy something in the market today, the price changes next week. Have you ever, the only thing that we are witnessing is the Baba Sokpe economics that we are currently witnessing in the country. It's a situation where they, they, are, they are protecting the Nara with taxpayers' money. They are trying to defend the Nara. They want to turn central bank to defenders of the universe. They are defending the Nara uh, against uh, free fall. However, things in the market are, are not coming down. Things that have gone up. When prices of goods was cheaper when dollar was at 700 naira under Buhari. But today, four times the price. Those same prices are now four times the price. But they want us to believe that dollars have allegedly gone down. You know, the, 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 that the defending of naira is working, but the price of goods are not coming down. Mm. So the reality stares us in the face to the contrary to what the government wants us to believe. Is that the fault of the government? Because some people will say that the government have, uh, with all of the cushioning effect that they bring, $10,000 uh, um, to BDCs uh, with regards to the, um, uh, that, uh, I'm trying to find the word that they called it. Uh, and then now they have that. And then also uh, they are trying to make sure that the pale naira has strength, Duc auction, that's the word. So, and then on the, on the flip side, the, uh, the dollar or the naira to the dollar is uh, 1,009 at some point and then came down to 1,002. But it's not affecting what is in the market. So is that the government? A situation where the tariff cost to import into the country is higher than the dollar rate. You want things to come down from the market? Things will not come down. As an importer today of goods into the country, if is anybody sure what the country is going to be tomorrow, why will anything come down? Because business people look at the body language of the government. Economic people, investors look at the body language of the government. The body language of this government is that of cluelessness. The government does not, does not know what it is doing. So when the government appears to not know anything that it's doing, the country will be an autopilot. And that is why we are currently witnessing what we have today in the country. There's practically nobody in charge of the economy of this country. You can barely even see the Minister of, Econo of, of Finance and the coordinating minister of the economy. You can barely see him taking any step. So all you see is propaganda after propaganda being dished out at CBN. Mm. Because you talked about CBN, let's go back to the bank capitalization. Now, what are your thoughts? What are your, uh, what are your thoughts with regards to that? Uh, some people say by the time you ch begin to check, uh, you want to do transfer, the number of banks you find, at least this is a very good step in the right direction. Do you see it as that also? Well, I wouldn't say it's a bad policy entirely. However, my suspicion is that, uh, you know, there's a new sheriff in town uh, at the CBN, 
And if you go to the CBN, the CBN is like a Lagos Island Association where almost all the directors are Yorubas. Removed competent directors, you know, and replaced them with uh, ethnic jingoists who are Babasoko economists. They are now in charge of CBN, running CBN. So I think what the new sheriff is doing is trying to, you know, raise capitalization so that they cannot buy off the banks. This is my suspicion. What has ethnicity got to do with this? Yeah, ethnicity has got everything to do with it. This, this government is more tribalistic than the Buhari regime. The Buhari regime was the regime that we thought, oh, we, we can never see tribalism like this again. Almost every sensitive appointment in this country is held by Yoruba man. Why? In a nation of different tribal and ethnic nationalities, CBN is headed by Yoruba man, FRA, almost every key agency of government is headed by Yoruba man. Why, will they why should a country be around like that? And the, the Lagos boys and the Lagos boys, the justification is that Buhari did it. So, Buhari was doing a bad thing, we all condemned him in this country. So, Tinubu should come and continue from where Buhari stopped and if we exceed the limit of Buhari, it doesn't just make any sense. We cannot continue to run a nation like this. Look at the amazing thing that has happened in Senegal with the, with the election of a 44-year-old young president. That's amazing. With the person of Basuri Faye. And that's amazing. And you will now have a prime minister, young, the revolutionary uh, Usman Sonko. They are leading a charged regime, a government in, in, in Senegal that Africa can be proud of. Here, we are, we are electing people that should be in retirement homes. Comrade Deji, isn't it too early to judge from Senegal? Well, our people say a weekend will be good. It's from, sometimes it's from Tuesday or Wednesday. You start knowing. We are on Friday of this regime. And when I say Friday, the government is almost one year. Every go democratic government in the that comes into government is the first two years that they work. That from the third year, they start campaigning and politicking. One year is gone. Tinubu has made life unbearable for the Nigerian people. In just one year, Tinubu is making Nigerians to miss Buhari. If anybody had thought that people can even miss Buhari, these were unthinkable things. Dollar was at 700 under Buhari. Dollar got to 1,900 under this man. And this is the man that said, Oh, I, I, you know, I worked at a uh, uh, so, so, so company. I'm, I know I have an idea about the economy. At least we can say Buhari is a general. Buhari does not know anything. And these are the man that the people come say, ah, you know, he surrounds himself with eggheads. You know, they do Lagos. Look at what they are doing with the country today. So there's no hope. The government does not inspire hope. You know, and basically, the reason why the country is an autopilot is because they practically the economic team of this government is extremely weak. And, but the only strength that this government has is that they have 99 media advisors, but they have zero economists ah. to run the government. Okay, before we go ahead, I, I need you to explain to our viewers what Baba Sokwe economist means. Because yes. I'm sure a lot of people don't understand what yeah, These are people that just say, oh, Baba has said, Baba, this, that's how they were running Lagos. They are not running Lagos on any technical issue or on, or on any in, intellect. Tinubu is an, is an emperor in Lagos. He rules Lagos. He has been in charge of Lagos since 1990 to date. So they think Lagos, Nigeria is Lagos. So they brought the Bagas open mentality from Lagos to Nigeria. And they don't know that Nigeria is a very comp complex and complicated nation. You know, the Bagas open way of doing things cannot work in Nigeria. And that is why. The, uh, they appear completely lost, completely lost in terms of economics, in terms of foreign policy. They have no idea. And that is why you saw that embarrassment from Qatar. You know, and almost every, in this government, in this government, 90% of Buhari ministers are unknown, uh, of Tinubu's ministers are unknown. Nigeria has even made them as enlightened, as politically savvy as I am. I don't know many of Telugu's ministers. But they're all there. Yeah, they don't exist. They are there, but they don't exist. Aside Wike, uh, Tunji Ojo, and uh, maybe Kiyamana that's trying to do something with APs and all this. Who else is, exists in this government? Which minister exists? Can you name 10 uh, Telugu's minister? 
I know over 10 of them. Name them. I'm the one asking the question here. Yeah, yeah, because I cannot name t 10 Tinubu ministers. And I'm someone that I know every governor in Nigeria. I can name them off my head, including even deputy governors. But I can't name Tinubu ministers. Because they don't exist. They only exist on paper, on the paper he appointed them with. They don't exist. They are not doing anything. Mm. All right. We'll go back to that um, question I asked you with regards to bank capitalization. Isn't that a good step in the right direction? I'll ask you again, because you say most of, most of what they have is just policy or good policies on paper. Isn't that a good um, policy itself then? I will say to an extent it is, because the, the, the essence is to give the market confidence, mm. you know, and protect protect investors' money and all that. However, if the motive is for a new sheriff in town to come and acquire the banks, so what has changed? After all, there were allegations under Buhari that some few people gathered together, they acquired some banks via proxy for Buhari and his people, and Tunde Sabi and all these people. So what has changed? So it means that the intention, because what the law always looks at is the intention behind every act. So if the intention is to strengthen the economy, and which I doubt, then I'll say it's commendable. But if the intention is for the new sheriff in town to gather everything and now be stakeholders and own the banks, you see that we're going to come down this lane again when another president comes, they will come and raise the, raise, raise the amount and also we take those, money, those banks from the Yoruba people that have, they are about to take them. So we cannot continue running a nation like this. You know, and that is my point. My point is that Whatever policy government wants to do, let it be that there's, it is from a, 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 a genuine heart, it is from a heart that cares for the people, it is about the people, it is about protecting the people, and not about um, enriching cabal. Because the Bwari regime for eight years, spent eight years enriching cabals. And you know that the Tinubu cabal is greater than the Bwari cabal. Already? I don't know Yes, that. indeed. Indeed, it is. It is. Under Bwari, you know, under the PDP, the people that were benefiting from, from Nigeria today, the people that were, are benefiting from Nigeria are one quarter of those that were benefiting under Buhari. Under, under the PDP regime, there was corruption. We were talking about corruption, 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 corruption. People that were benefiting in the country, maybe like 20,000, you know, under the Buhari regime, you could put the people benefiting in, in the coastal bus. They could fit him into a coastal bus. Now, under this Tinubu regime, the people benefiting, they can fit into a saloon car. Interesting. So, and that is not how to run a nation. Yeah. That is simply not how to run a nation. Okay, so I hear you say that um, we, we, we should be careful so that we don't come back to this cycle again. Yes. What then did, uh, during that election, the 2023 election, what exactly was the role of CSOs? What, how far did they even go to ensure that... Um, we don't even come here again to have this conversation. Yeah, if not for CSOs, we we'll never have had the revised electoral act. And God rest my late friend's soul, Comrade Dari or Daria Toye, who, alongside many of us, we aggressively pushed. We thought that IMEC was we're going to be sincere. We pushed for electronic transmission of results and all that. However, the politicians as usual beat us to the game. They refused to transmit results electronically. We thought that that was going to be one of the greatest innovation uh, and contribution that CSOs can ever make to our electoral development in Nigeria. Uh, just like the way we pushed for many reforms in the past with, with, with IMEC and critical stakeholders, you know, including foreign observers and all that, we thought that by pushing uh, the amendment of the Electoral Act, the, the unallowance Senate. Senate um, Senate still found a way to put loopholes in the Electoral Act, you know, which now the courts have legitimized, you know, and now those things are going to be counterproductive in future elections in the country. You know, so CSOs all over the world, we continue, just like what we, ha we have in Nigeria, continue to put pressure on stakeholders, especially stakeholders in the democratic process, to ensure that they play by the books. But the challenge is not the inability of the civil society to uh, hit the ground running or, or, or be assertive. But the, the political actors are never ready to ab uh, abide by the rules of the game. And that is why you saw abductions of 
INEC officials on election day all over the country. In my state, alone, almost 70 something INEC officials were abducted in Kogi. So, and all over the country, the situation was the same. So, irrespective of the reforms we tried to push with INEC, with the National Assembly during the last uh, election, uh, gov governorship, presidential, and uh, uh, parliamentary elections, it was not effective because the critical stakeholders were just not willing to play ball. Mm. Okay. So now, what, what is the plan coming from the CSOs? Because we also saw what happened aside from the general election, the off-cycle election in uh, Imo, in Kogi, or in Bayelsa. We also saw almost the same thing happened. So what is the plan? What is the lesson that the CSOs have learned that in 2027, we're not coming back to say, they beat us um, to the game? The, 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 the issue is that no matter what the CSOs do in terms of advocacy, it will never be effective if critical stakeholders like the police the military, you know, and the paramilitary, the security agency, and in particular, INEC, if they continue to aid and abate politicians in rigging elections. Because, you see, one of the most important stakeholders in any election is, are the security agencies. Where the security agencies give cover to politicians and allow them to have a free day to subvert the will of the people, there's practically nothing in the civil society because even the electoral act forbids civil society from getting into the arena or descending into the arena or getting into the fray. So all you can do is to be at the polling unit, to supervise the election, and to write your report. In fact, they will not naturally challenge you to say if you write a, a report that is not favorable, they will challenge you to say you have no right. You know, whether you are an international observer or a domestic observer, they will always tell you you have no right to pass judgment on the election. It is INEC's duty to declare who won an election or who did not win. So, uh, yes, CSOs must push for reforms and continue to do so. As well as reforms that will ensure credible, free and fair, transparent electoral process. However, it is the security agencies and INEC, critical stakeholders, INEC and the political actors that must co make sure they comply with the Provisional Electoral Act. Mm. All right, we do for a break, but before we go on that, because you mentioned Kogi State, let's go back to Kogi State during that election. Would you say that all that happened brought forth a free, fair, credible election that's, um, and now, how, how is Kogi doing in terms elections of did not, Elections did not even hold in Kogi. Oh, they, really? They want results even before election. In almost all polling units. Everybody knows. The security agencies, they know. I let know. The observers know. The politicians are aware that they want results. And that is why you saw that many people left the polling units. Because once there's a participation in an election where the outcome is already determined, days before the election. So what is the essence? And that is why I pity those who are going to buy from against this president in 2027 and say they want to contest an election against this president. You know, because the Kogi and the Imo elections have shown that this president does not believe in elections. Are you saying that the um, election that brought forth Hope, Uzodima, and Usman Ududu? Massively read. They were massively, one of the worst elections that have, we have witnessed in Nigeria in recent times. Massively read. In fact, these elections have taken us back to the 2000 and, and, uh, 2007 era of election uh, of electionary in Nigeria, where people just write results at polling units. Because that's exactly what happened. So, what is the essence of talking about any electoral reform? with this kind of conduct or mindset going into an election? What is even the essence of contesting? Mm. Let's go on a quick break. And when we return, we'll conclude this conversation with Comrade DG Adeonju, um, activist and legal practitioner. See you after this time out. Join us again. You just joined us. This is the conversation reaching you from Cap Fans Television today here in the nation's capital Abuja. If you just joined us, you've actually missed out on the first part of the show, but then you can still join in the second part as my guest. The show today is Comrade DG Adin Ojuho, he is a legal practitioner and uh, an activist. All right, before we went on that um, break, we've actually talked about um, the elections, but now let's let's still stay on the election and governance, politics, and all. Today's Nigerian Tribune um, headline says. Two, um, I'm going to bring out two um, uh, headlines and I'd like you to take them in one breath. Now, the first one says, Atiku, we case set to rekindle rivalry at PDP neck. XVP arise for crunch meeting. But on the flip side, you have um, on the reverse peace pact. If my actions will be taken as weakness, I will surprise them. Fubara says, as he says that... Um, 
it's going to be fire for fire. And I was asking someone, was that necessary? I think Fubara is more of a ma more matured person than Wike. Because really? you see that, yes, his comments have been quite tempered. You know, when Wike goes all out, he does name calling. Fubara tries to talk without mentioning names. But we know who he's referring to. And um, I think Fubara is likely to uh, do is the underdog in this uh, political tussle. But I think Fubara is someone to watch out more for because he said something remarkable the other time. He said, you know, we accountants, we don't talk much. We just talk small and you see plenty of work. But lawyers talk a lot. So as a lawyer, <laughs> you know, I, what I interpret that to be is that he, he has someone to really watch out for. You know, because he's not as carefree as Wiki, you know, who is very loud, who is always making all kinds of statements. So, and I think, you know, Wiki should take the back seat. This man has betrayed you, no doubt. Mm, you are the one that imposed him. Four years is almost here. You know, four years is not a long time. Just wait for him in front. And so you see it as a betrayal. Yeah, of course. He should lay an ambush of you know, at the next Do you poll. see the one that happened between Wiki and um, um, the former minister, Rotimi Amechi, as yes. betrayer also? Yes, also. Apparently, Wiki betrayed even the people that put him there as governor, which is the Jonathans, you know? So, but this is what politics is for you, especially Nigerian politicians that lack, lack political ideology, you know? And this is what you get, you know? And, and this is why we say, again, lack of internal democracy in the political parties contributes to some of these... Uh, uh, bickerance and all this uh, tussle for power. If the political parties were uh, democratic, someone would not be able to impose someone as governor. You know, Wiki keeps saying, I was the one that bought the form for everybody. He, they, you know, Wiki is a carefree person, talks carelessly. So that's the reason why we have some of these issues. You know, moving on, I think I'll go to the other issue. Mm. That you Article raised. Wiki's yes. Field. About Atiku and Wiki's, Atiku should go and rest. You know, like I, I like I called him recently. He's the Emir of Dubai. He's been in Dubai, chilling after he lost the general election. He thinks sleeping on social media is opposition. Should go and look at his. Do you see that as chilling? Or it could be strategy. No, it's not strategy. As we strategize. It's not strategy. These are these are how lazy politicians operate. The Nigerian political and ruling elite are lazy people. They do not want to put in the work. They want civil society and citizens to go and die for them, they will answer, so that they can come and take power through the back door. Nobody is going to die for any politician again. Look at how their children took power in Senegal. The Senegalese opposition, led by Usman, Usman Sonko, strongman Usman Sonko, they were on the street protesting, challenging, resisting the government, even when the government was busy sending them to jail. Atiku has not even been arrested. He's already running to Dubai to go and chill. After he, he lost the presidential election, he did only one protest. He, he barely walked five minutes on the protest. He was on the car throughout the protest. After the protest, he was tired. Since then, he went to Dubai. He doesn't know how to do opposition. Him and Peter will be asleep on Twitter. Just ranting on Twitter and talking rubbish on Twitter. This is not how to do opposition. You, nobody gives power. To somebody because he's tweeting. You you take power. Look, this is what Tinubu said. Tinubu said you grab power. You run with it. After grabbing it, you run. And he, that's what he did in the election. He grabbed the power and he ran with it. So he didn't win. I believe that he didn't win the election fair and square. But he has been declared as the winner. And he has also been won by courts. So the courts have legitimized the winning. So I must accept him as the winner. So that is how you get power. You don't sit on Twitter and you're just tweeting four years. Is, we, are, we are tweeting four years away without any form of strategy. And once you criticize them, they are brainwashed supporters who are apparently intoxicated in their political wine that they've been served. Who are you referring to here? Yes, the articulated supporters and the obedience. They are brainwashed people. They've been served wine by their political masters. And they are drunk on the wine. And they cannot see any wrong in their master and their political gods. And this is, I kept shouting during the last election, this uh, man is going to snatch and run with the election. They kept insulting me. I said, have you ever seen if Buhari kept running alone 
in 2015, they will never have defeated PDP. The opposition had to come together. They had, see, no body that is sick without first admitting that he's sick and goes to a hospital can get cure. So the Nigerian opposition, there's practically no opposition in the country. They're just fooling around. All these things we are saying, we we care that works for Tinubu is the one who is in charge of PDP. He uses his boy, uh, the National Secretary of PDP, uh, Sam Anyahu, Sam Daddy. They are the ones that run PDP. With this acting chairman, he works for Wiki. He's always with Wiki. Sam Daddy goes to the SGF's place. He serves tea for SGF. These are the people that are in charge of PDP. And you think that this, this PDP can challenge Tinubu in 2027. They, they should all go and sleep. How, how about where you have Atiku saying that every, they, they should be like everyone come together and form a... He should, should retire from politics first before he says that. He should retire from politics first. If he retires from politics, we will not take him seriously that he says. He said, look at Us great man Usman Sonko, strong man Usman Sonko in, in uh, Senegal. He, uh, he, he appointed his mentee uh, Fai to become president. Usman Sonko is a young man as well. Young man that was persecuted and jailed severally. But Atiku feels that contesting election is his bad right. Uh, newly introduced presidential candidate, Peter Obi, now also feels that uh, running for election is like MMM. He'll be using election to raise money like Uncle so every four years now. So these people, they do not know what opposition is. And they cannot challenge him. We'll go and write it down. Now, we'll come back to where you st st talked about, um, you were talking about the Senegal election and the fact that they have a youth now. But then you still talked about, Atiku, you talked about Peter Obi, that they should go and retire. But if you come back again to Nigeria, it's the same people who will tell you that um, we don't want, it is not you to clock. It, we want the um, older generation. But then there are the same people that are saying you should take lessons from Senegal. And we just... Um, more like tomato to me to same difference. Indeed, you are completely right because I, I think I was seeing some pictures of uh, the youth of Senegal. They put the fire on one and then they put it out be 60 something year old man. They said, This is the youth of Nigeria. Then some people did the articles on 70 something years old. Then they put fire. So Nigerians are not serious. The, every time you see Nigerians opposing someone or doing something, it's because they want their own man. And that is why we say that they also hate corruption. They only hate it when they are not the one doing the corruption. You see people, people that run election based on tribe, campaigning from moving from church to church, they'll be calling other people bigots. Which bigots is more than someone that was moving from church to church or that was running an election because he kept saying, you must vote for me because I'm a, it is now my turn to rule the middle cause of this world. Which bigots can be more than that? So this is my problem with Nigerians. Nigerians breathe hypocrisy, they eat hypocrisy, they live hypocrisy, and they are hypocrites. All right, our time is fast spent. Let's um, wind down. But before we let you go, let's leave politics and then go to other matters. I saw where you tweeted recently and you said, unquote, this madness of defaming people to trend needs to stop. You say Apostle Suleiman is a Muslim just to trend. When called to defend this, you will start stressing lawyers. This was how someone went as far as saying rubbish about Mercy Chimu's newborn baby. Criticize, don't defame. And then you finally tweeted that big men and rich pastors should stop using the police to arrest people who defame them. They should sue. There's nothing criminal about defamation. The police have better things to do. Are you saying that those who defamed Nathaniel Bassi that they have the right to do so, and you, that he has his wrong to go to the police. You see, the Cyber Crime Act of 2015, which Jonathan was misled to sign, is one of the worst laws that we've ever, that have ever been signed by any president in Nigeria. That Cyber Crime Act is now the premise upon which police is using to arrest and harass people. The police have better work, job than receiving petitions from politicians, big men gospel singers, all these people that feel defamed. Defamation. Do you feel defamed? The yes, feel or are defamed or, or entitled to def or, or entitled of believe that they've been defamed. Defamation is purely a civil matter. World over. When somebody defames you, what is bringing police inside? It's like when police, police want to act as debt recovery. Police are not supposed to be involved in debt recovery because 
Police station is not a bank. Police station is not EFCC. We are battling a serious security problem in the country. Our borders are barely policed or manned. Terrorists are having a field day. Kidnappers are... Every week they kidnap little children and women in this country. You want to turn the police into petitioner receivers from big men and gospel singers? Doesn't make any sense. If somebody has defamed you, rightly or wrongly, sue the person. I have no problem with anybody suing. Any, people have defamed me severally. I didn't sue them. But if any day I decide to sue them, I will not use any police. To, because that's harassment. You are harassing people because of your status in the society. People go to the extent of look at a pastor just recently was saying that he's going to lock somebody up. What for? If somebody has defamed you, sue the person. So, so, so just go straight to the, um, to the court. Yes, file an action in defamation against the person. Because our police, in fact, most of our police are guarding big men already. So there's already a security problem in the country. So you cannot be using taxpayers' money to prosecute defamatory. Nigeria does not even have the money where we are a broke nation. We are, using, we, are, we, are, we are practically borrowing money to pay salaries currently in Nigeria. Yes, we are. We are, the, we are not just a broke nation, we are the poverty capital of the world. Go and look at our, our, our debt servicing profile right now as a nation. And you will now realize that Nigeria is spending money that it does not have. And that is why the apartments of this world, when I see them doing bazaar and the National Assembly, I'm perturbed. Because it's like these people, they live in a bubble, an imaginary bubble, where they think Nigeria is a rich nation. And we, we, we cannot even afford this expensive lifestyle that politicians are currently living. So the police also do not have the luxury of attending to petitions because if, if we normalize this norm, everybody is going to be writing the police. Even when you have an altercation between you and your neighbor, you are going to write to the police and say they should arrest somebody because the person has defamed you. So this is not an, a sustainable mechanism. People must learn to sue when they feel defamed. All right. Finally, what is it with, um, why did you decide to get involved with the very dark man's issue? Yes. So, simple reason. Basically, I personally feel that as long as defamation is concerned, it should be purely a civil matter. And the police should not get involved. Because when the police get involved, and, and imagine the guy was arrested and they kept him for nine days. Did he kill somebody? Did he kill somebody? It's not a capital offense. You cannot arrest somebody and just keep him for nine days because of defamation. It doesn't make any... It, things like this are not done anywhere. And that is why when human rights index reports are, are written, Nigeria always ranks very low. The police must stop discrediting Nigeria by making unnecessary arrests and unnecessary demands. Magistrates must stop issuing remand orders to the police and in respect of defamatory issues, if somebody has committed armed robbery or murder, then you can issue remand orders. If you cannot keep people in custody for nine days, two weeks, because of defamation, it's, it's, it's unheard of. It's unthinkable. That, that was why I got involved in the matter. Mm. All right. Comrade Deja, 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 time is fast spent. Thank you so much for your time with us. It's been a wonderful time having this chat with you. Thank you for having me. All right, viewers, that's where we end this conversation for today. We've been chatting with Comrade Deji Adeyonju, who is a legal practitioner and a civil rights activist. It's been a wonderful time here on The Conversation. My name is Annabelle Oji, and it's been a wonderful time. I'm sure you must have been rightly educated, entertained, and informed. I will see you next time. Keep watching Captain Television. God bless you and yours. God bless Nigeria. <laughs>